Hello and welcome to A Morning with Nancy Pearl. My name is Jill Edwards and I am co-president of the Friends of the Langley Library. The Friends are hosting this event in conjunction with Snow Isle Libraries, Whidbey Island Center for the Arts, and we also have sponsors, the Star Store and the Inn at Langley. We're so excited for our special guest today. Nancy Pearl is a best-selling author, an award-winning librarian, and a literary critic. But she will tell you that first and foremost, she is a reader. Since 1998, Nancy's been coming to Whidbey Island to share with us her uh, insights about her favorite books of the year, uh, compelling us to read books that maybe wouldn't have been on our radar. I know some of you have actually been to every single one of those events, and uh, some of you are attending for the first time. Since we're having it on Zoom, we had over a thousand people register, and so we know there are a lot of first time attendees, so that's pretty exciting. Um, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. A uh, link to Nancy's book list uh, is on the Snow Isle event page. Um, we're also going to put it on the Facebook page, and I think it'll, the uh, link will also be at the end of the presentation. Um, the event is being recorded, and it'll be on the Snow Isle site within a few days. We will put that link on our Facebook page, and um, it'll be on the Snow Isle YouTube page as well. All of your mics are muted, so if you have any questions during Nancy's presentation, go ahead and just put them in the chat, and my co-president, Ellen Whitman, will sort through those and consolidate them, and Nancy will get to as many as she can. If you would like to support the Friends of the Langley Library, we will put donation information up at the end of the event. With that, let's get started. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to hear what you've been reading. And we'd also like to hear about your latest book. Uh, take it away, Nancy. Thank you so much. Um, I OK, Vicki, do you want to go with the first, um, the first slide? Great. Thank you. Um, so what I did this year was collect um, a, a really lovely list, I think, of, of many diverse books, some brand new, some um, a little bit older. I always think that we need to remember that just because um, a book is a few years old uh, and no longer on the new bookshelf in the library or the bookstore, um, there's still a lot of good reading off those shelves as well. Um, so the first book that I want to start talking about that I want to start with is Scott Anderson's The Quiet Americans, Four CIA Spies at the Dawn of the Cold War, a tragedy in three acts. You might remember, you might be familiar with the author Scott Anderson. He wrote a few years ago, um, he wrote a wonderful, wonderful biography of T.E. Lawrence called Lawrence in Arabia. And I think the fact that he said in rather than of Arabia is how, which is how we usually refer to T.E. Lawrence. Um, it really gives a sense of the kind of writer that he is and what he's interested in doing in presenting. Um, because what, what Scott Anderson does in his books is really contextualize the subject. So you get not only, um, you get in this book, The Quiet Americans, not only um, the story of the beginnings of the CIA and the four and four men who worked on it, worked for it in the early days, but you get a picture of what the world was like at that time. Um, what was going on, not just necessarily in um, the government or politically. So for me, whenever a new book by Scott Anderson comes out, I'm uh, like, I know I'm going to love it. And I particularly loved this one because I, I one of my, um, one of the sorts of books that I always enjoy reading are spy novels. And this is, um, this is a nonfiction book that does read like a spy novel. So The Quiet Americans for CIA Spies at the Dawn of the Cold War, a tragedy in three acts, um, begins with the end of World War II um, at a time when the Soviet Union was was really moving away from being our ally as they were during the war to 
um, being an enemy, being somebody who um, made the United States and its government really, really nervous. And the beginnings of the CIA arose out of that that feeling. And the four men that P that Scott Anderson focuses on are um, Frank Wisner, Ed Lansdale, Michael Burke, and Peter Sitchell. Now, I have to say, of those four, I had heard of Frank Wisner and had read some other books where he was, um, some other nonfiction books where he was mentioned in. Um, I had no idea who Michael Burke was, although I was very interested to learn that, um, that his early career was in Hollywood um, behind the scenes. And he went on after his work in the CIA, he went on to be um, a, a minority owner of the New York Yankees. And I had never heard of Peter Sitchell at all, who was a German, uh, German American who came to work for the CIA. The person who you might have heard of the most, if, especially if you do read spy novels or um, histories of, of um, post-war uh, America is Ed Lansdale, because Ed Lansdale was the basis for The Ugly American, um, that very popular book by Burdick and Letterer. Uh, he was, in fact, it, you know, he became um, the ugly American. Uh, and that, really that's what he's known for ex besides his CIA stuff. But in this book, you get really insight into characters such as Wild Bill Donovan, who was, uh, who was the head of the OSS, George Kennan, the great um, political scientist, historian, Edgar J. Edgar Hoover, all of those people make up this book. It really is, um, it really does, you know, one of the highest uh, uh, praises we, we sometimes give nonfiction is to say it reads like a novel. And this one definitely reads like a novel, only it's true. Um, uh, Scott Anderson has a, a viewpoint um, about the CIA, about post-war America um, that comes through very clearly. He's not hiding any of his feelings. And um, you know, this would be a book that, you know, the holiday season is coming up. This would be a book for anyone who's interested in um, the history of the last half of the 20th century, uh, who's interested in, in figuring out and understanding how we are where we are today, what led up to so much that is still going on in the world today. Those are the answers. Um, you're you're going to get all that in The Quiet Americans uh, by Scott Anderson. I loved this book. The next book is um, a book of poetry uh, by Jericho Brown called The Tradition. It's published by Copper Canyon Press, um, of course, a local Washington, state of Washington publisher, and it won the 2020 Pulitzer Prize. Um, Jericho Brown is um, a black man and his poetry is powerful. It's um, sometimes gut-wrenching and it's pretty amazing. And to give you a sense of it, I wanted to read one of the poems from this book. It's called Hero. She never knew one of us from another, so my brothers and I grew up fighting over our mother's mind, like sun-colored suitors in a Greek myth. We were willing to do evil. We kept chocolate around our mouths. The last of her mother's lot, she cried at funerals, cried when she whipped me. She whipped me daily. I am most interested in people who declare gratitude for their childhood beatings. None of them took what my mother gave, Walk, waking us for school with sharp slaps to our bare thighs. That side of the family is darker. I should be grateful, so I will be. No one on earth knows how many abortions happened before a woman risked her freedom by giving that risk a name, by taking it to breast. I don't know why I am alive now that I still cannot impress the woman who whipped me into being. I turned my mother into a grandmother. She thanks me by kissing my sons. Gratitude is black. Black as a hero returning from war to a country that banked on his death. Thank God it can't get much darker than that.
Isn't that an amazing poem? Um, you know, uh, Jericho Brown uh, is, 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 quite a, is quite young. Um, winning the Pulitzer Prize will really, I hope, um, keep his name and his poetry before us for a long, long time. Next, please. Brampton Wick, really we're going from um, a, 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 that book of poetry to this wonderful light fiction. Um, Brampton Wick by, is one of the seven novels, I think, by Elizabeth Fair, um, mostly published in the 50s and early 60s. They're very British. If what you're looking for, I, you know, I'm a real Anglophile and I, I read, um, so many books uh, published in, in, in England, uh, you know, lovely novels by English writers. Um, if you're a fan of um, Barbara Pym's novels, for example, I think you'll, or uh, Elizabeth Cadell, um, I think you'll really enjoy Brampton Wick and Elizabeth Fair's other books. They've all been brought back into print by a publisher named, uh, a British publisher, Dean Street Press. And I would really encourage you to look up Dean Street Press, to Google the press and see all the books uh, that they have reissued along with um, a publisher that they distribute, a publisher called, and, and this is a wonderful name for a publisher, Furrowed Middlebrow Press. Isn't that great? Um, and uh, what Dean Street Press and Furrowed Middle, Bow, Middle Brow Press both do is reissue books published mainly between 1920 and the 1960s. Oh my gosh, they're so, I mean, I've just been going through their catalog of books and reading pretty much everything that they're publishing. Um, so Brampton Wick is a small town and what this, a, a very, a village really in rural England and what, what the author has done is focus on the interrelationships among um, the, the few people who live in that village. It's just a great quiet escape and that's what I find that I've been reading so much of um, during this pandemic. So Brampton Wick, it's the first of six by Elizabeth Fair. Next. The Missing by Tim Gautreaux. I think that's how you pronounce it. Oh my gosh, this is a fabulous novel. And he's a fabulous writer to get to know, um, to read all of his books. This is a book set right after World War I. And the main character who fought in the war um, a, a man named Simon's, uh, named Sam Simono, um, has really come out of the war kind of damaged emotionally. Um, you remember right after World War I, there was another uh, worldwide illness, the, the flu, and people died from it um, in great, great, great numbers, including Sam's wife and his young son. Now he's working as a department store policeman in New Orleans um, and he's on duty one day when a young girl is kidnapped from the store and he goes after her because he has to find her. She is the missing and perhaps she'll be the one person that he can restore as he can't restore his own family. Oh my gosh, such a good book. Um, the characters are so richly described. The setting is wonderful. And really it answers the question, um, are, are, how much are we responsible for other people? Are we our brother's keeper or not? Um, just a terrific, terrific novel. Okay, next. Um, the Unquiet Dead by Ausma Khan is the first in a series of mysteries featuring a Muslim policeman in Toronto uh, named Isa Katak and his um, non-Muslim uh, Canadian assistant, uh, a young woman named Rachel Getty. Um, 
what ISA's job is with the Toronto Police Force is working with refugee and immigrant groups there. And what happens, the plot of this book really begins with um, the death of a man who it turns out is not who he seems. I, I, really, um, I really love books that, that give me a sense of the past, that give me a sense of history that, that I learn something from. And this is, a, this is a novel, this is a mystery in which Issa's um, and Rachel's investigations into this, the death of this man really show that, that the origins of the crime um, all began back in the Bosnian War and especially the massacre at Srebrenica. So um, this is, I really loved this book. I listened actually to this book um, on audio on one of my miles long walks every morning. And I thought it was just great and went on to read the rest of the series or the next, I read the next two in the series. And I have to say that the first one, this one, The Unquiet Dead is a really good mystery. The next one is, pretty good and then I would not read after that um, in this series but this first one is definitely worth getting uh, you know it's in paperback now it would be a great little stocking stuffer I think so that's the unquiet dead next Gods of the Upper Air by Charles King Charles King is a nonfiction writer he's written many many um, really interesting nonfiction books. I particularly enjoyed this one. Gods of the Upper Air has a terrific subtitle, How a Circle of Renegade Anthropologists Reinvented Race, Sex, and Gender in the 20th Century. And here is the circle of renegade anthropologists that he's talking about. Zora, Zora Neale Hurston, Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, Franz Boas, Ella Deloria. What these six anthropologists did studying under Franz Boas at um, Columbia University is they really invented a new branch of anthropology. They invented what's now known as cultural anthropology. And how this was important in the 20th century and now the 21st century, perhaps even more now, is, is the question of um, how, how meaningless it is to compare the goodness or the importance of one culture to another, that one culture is not better than another, it's just different from another. And you know, from what we know, uh, what many people are familiar with, for example, Margaret Mead's um, studies uh, in Samoa, you know, that the only way you can really judge a culture or understand a culture, not judge it, but really understand a culture is to live there and to see everything about them and to understand that their views as our views are just one way of looking at the world, that there isn't a right way or a wrong way. So that's Gods of the Upper Air. Um, let me also say that this is one of those readable, readable nonfiction books. This is what we used to call um, uh, books for the interested layperson. Uh, so this is not a scholarly book at all. It does give really interesting, does give readers a really interesting look at um, people like Zora Neale Hurston, who we have come to know as a novelist, but, but really began as this anthropologist. So that's Gods of the Upper Air. Next. Isn't this a great, great, great cover? I love this cover. So this is a first novel, uh, Temporary, by Hilary Leichter. I picked this book up because the blurb at the top of the book, uh, top of the cover, which you can't really read from, from where you're sitting probably, is by Kelly Link, who is one of my 
other favorite writers. So temporary, um, when you read temporary, you have to have a bit of a suspension of your disbelief. You have to enter, you have to kind of willingly enter the world of the novel. And the world of the novel is a world in which for many people, and certainly for the main character of this book, who does not have a name, that the, the, the deepest wish of the main character in this book is to get a real full-time job. She spends her time as, um, as what we would call a gig worker. She spends her time doing temporary work um, of various sorts. Um, she, as the book goes on, those temporary jobs really take on a more and more surreal, um, surreal kind of, uh, they're, they get weirder, let me just say it in plainer words, they, the, the jobs get weirder and weirder. So she starts out, um, you know, answering telephones in um, an office, which many gig workers do, uh, get, you know, have that kind of job and goes on to jobs of, for example, um, being a human barnacle working on a pirate ship, uh, working for an assassin. And as the book goes on, her desire for a permanent job, which she doubts is ever gonna happen. Her mother was a gig worker. Her grandmother was a gig worker. Um, it just grows more and more, it's just so important to her. And um, the book is funny, the book is surreal. And I really, I, I just absolutely loved it. One of the things um, that, I, that I really enjoyed um, about the book is that she, because she's always away from her apartment um, doing things like being a human barnacle or being on this pirate ship, um, her apartment is vacant and her 18 different boyfriends um, have all moved in. And each of the different boyfriends um, has their own uh, talent has their own specialty. Um, the, the cook boyfriend, the handyman boyfriend, um, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So I just, I absolutely loved, I loved this book and thought it was just great fun. Okay. Next. Wobble to Death by Peter Lovesy. You mystery readers might be, um, might be familiar with this book. Uh, with, not with this book particularly, but with the author. Uh, Peter Lovesy has gone on to write a ton of other mysteries, um, a wonderfully uh, wonderful British mystery writer. Wobble to Death was his first novel published in 1970. This is the 50th anniversary collector's edition of the book. It's set in London in 1879, and it introduces one of Peter Lovesy's um, uh, series characters, Sergeant Cribb. So it's set during a six day, 500 mile speed walking endurance race, which was known as the Wobble. Obviously, there's going to be a murder. And obviously, Sergeant Cribb is going to try to find out who done it. Um, Wobble to Death was included in the Mystery Writers of America list of best 100 mystery novels. Um, and I think once you read one Peter Lovesy, you'll either really enjoy it enough to want to go on to all the rest, or you'll feel like one was enough. OK, thank you. One more. All the Way to the Tigers by Mary Morris. Mary Morris is a novelist and a memoirist. This is one of her memoirs. Um, as a result of, she was planning to go, uh, you know, she had a trip planned because she is, uh, because her memoirs all deal with um, travel that she does. She's kind of um, an indefatigable travel writer and traveler. Um, she was planning um, a trip. She had a trip all planned. 
Um, but it, it was the winter in New York. She and her husband went skating in Rockefeller Center in 2008. And she had a very, very bad fall on the ice. So bad that there was some question about whether she would ever walk again. But as she was very slowly recuperating, the only thing that got her out of her funk, and of course, you know, you can imagine how, how bad she was feeling both physically and emotionally. Um, but one of the things that got her out of her funk was reading Thomas Mann's book, Death in Venice. And she came across this line. He would go on a journey, not far, not all the way to the tigers. And she started thinking about that line. And she decided that when she recovered enough, she would go all the way to the tigers. Um, when I'm reading Armchair Travel, there are several things that I really want from it. I, you know, I want to find out about the place. I want to learn. I want to learn, you know, kind of in-depth stuff about the place where the writer's going. I want to, I want to learn what the writer learned, what the traveler learned from this trip. And I want to get a sense of who the traveler is. I want to feel like I know the traveler better at the end of the book than I did at the beginning. And All the Way to the Tigers is a book that really satisfied me on all those levels. Um, one of the things that I learned, which I'm sure many of you already know, I did not, um, is that, Indi that India is the only place where tigers are found. There are no tigers in Africa, for example, which is where I always thought tigers were from. I also learned that all tigers, no matter what their sex is, are, are referred to as she. And I also learned how hard it is to find a tiger, to really go all the way, go all the way to where the tigers are. So over the course of three years, Mary Morris went back and forth from her home in New York to India to try to fulfill this desire to see tigers in their natural habitat. It's a very readable book and, um, oh, it was, you know, I sure enjoyed it. It was sure fun to read. So um, that's all the way to the Tigers, perfect for any armchair traveler. Okay, next, The Cactus League by Emily Nemens. Emily Nemens um, actually grew up in Seattle. And uh, as I learned when I interviewed her for my TV show, she's a great baseball fan. Um, now, this is a book that, that this is a character driven novel in stories, told in stories. How many stories? Well, this is a book about baseball. So of course it's told in nine stories, but is this a book about baseball? I would say, yeah, if you're a fan of baseball, you know, if you're a big baseball fan, that will give you an added reason maybe to read this book. But I would say that anyone who loves character driven novels, anyone who likes really smart, spirited writing will really enjoy the Cactus League. So during spring training, about half the teams go to Florida and they're known as the Grapefruit League. And about half the, the other half of the teams go to Arizona and they're known as the Cactus League. So this is a novel set during spring training in, um, in Arizona. And what Emily Nemens has done in each of these nine chapters is focus on a different person who is, um, who is part of or interested in this Major League Baseball team, the Lions. So of course, she's going to have um, people like uh, the owner of the team, but she also focuses on a coach, a batting coach, and a pitcher who has just had Tommy John surgery, really difficult surgery on his arm, and is wondering whether he can ever come back, um, can ever be as good a pitcher as he was before. There's a chapter about a concession stand worker. 
There's also a chapter about the team's organist. You know, are they going to replace that organ that he plays with just taped music, digitally, uh, digitally provided music, and and also some chapters on these these hangers on. Um, if if you remember the character that Susan Sarandon played in Bull Durham, there's there's uh, a chapter or two about these women who follow the team every year. Um, and try to hook up with uh, the hot young baseball player. Um, so the Cactus League, you know, I'm not a huge baseball fan at all. That's not the sport that I like to watch, but I love good writing. And I, <clears throat> as should be clear by now, after all these years, I absolutely love character driven fiction. So the Cactus League is, um, uh, was high on my list of favorite books for this year. Next, um, She Votes, How U.S. Women Won Suffrage and What Happened Next by Bridget Quinn. I actually think this would be a really good gift for any teenage um, girl in particular, because this is a book that um, that, that is such um, an accessible, you know, it's an oversized book. You can tell from the cover, this is not gonna be, you know, just the colors of the cover are so kind of, and I say this in only the best way, in your face, um, that it's gonna be a book that's gonna really make women powerful. Um, so She Votes really is a history of the suffrage movement, some of which, we're familiar with because it's become part of the culture, our culture, but much of it that it, much of it is going to be a surprise to readers. And perhaps the best thing about this book, or one of the best things about this book, is that it has wonderful color illustrations, many, many, many color illustrations um, by a hundred different women artists. I loved this book and I felt like um, I learned a lot from it, but I was highly entertained by it as well, which is exactly what I think the author intended. Next. There But For Thee by Allie Smith. So Allie Smith is a British writer and she is, um, she just published the last in a quartet of seasonal novels. So there's one summer, spring, autumn, winter, which really talk about Britain, um, where Britain is today, really cover a lot of things like Brexit, all in novel format. Um, I didn't love those books. I had trouble getting into them. And even though I'm a big Allie Smith fan, um, they, they weren't what I was, what I wanted to read right now. So I went back and listened to my favorite Allie Smith novel, which is this one, There But For Thee. Um, and you all know how that, how that phrase, There But For The Grace of God Go I, um, how that ends. But this is There But For Thee. And you can, after reading the book, understand better why she called it that. There are four sections in this book, four words in the title. And the plot of this book is that a young, um, a young man in his like early 30s is invited to a dinner party by um, a, a, a friend, uh, a, a, a recent friend. And he doesn't know, this young man doesn't know um, who's, who the people who have given the dinner party. And they're, everybody's sitting around the table um, eating. And in between two of the courses, say in between um, the soup and the salad courses, this young man gets up from the table, excuses himself, goes upstairs, and locks himself in one of the bedrooms of this house and refuses to come out. And why did he do this? Well, that is not clear until we read the next three sections of the book. 
So it's told from the point of view of three of four different people. And each of the sections just really adds to the depth and really the the wonder of this novel. And one of the characters is, I always like it when there are child kid characters in an adult novel um, and it's done well. And this little girl in this novel um, is done exceptionally well by Ally Smith. So there, but for the, God, I love this book so much. I hope somebody reads it. Okay. Next, The Lotus Eaters by Tatiana Soli. Oh my gosh, this is another novel that I absolutely loved. So let me just say here, because I know that there are many more people listening than have ever been at Wicca uh, for the last um, 23 years that I've been coming to talk about books. So, you know, all these books that I'm talking about today, I loved and, and people sometimes feel like, um, that I just love, that I have no taste, no discernment, and I just love every book uh, that I read, um, which in a way is true. But I am, I have to say, I am one of, I am a, an extremely critical reader. And for every book that I end up finishing, I probably started, um, you know, five or six other books and put them down because I didn't like them. So when I talk about a book that I love, it's um, it, it's it's one book out of many 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 books that I didn't love. So that's the load. So this is the Lotus Eaters. It is a first novel. I was blown away by this book, um, uh, which came out a few years ago, and um, it's the story of a, a woman, Helen Adams whose brother has been killed or has disappeared in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And she decides that she is going to go to Vietnam and try to find him. Um, and the way she decides to do this is that she, she passes herself off as a combat photographer. Um, the book opens, with, um, opens in 1975 with the scene at the um, during the fall of Saigon um, when when the North Vietnamese have come into the city and everyone is trying to get everyone who can is trying to get out of Saigon um, before the city is taken over by the North. Um, it opens at the US Embassy which is sending as many helicopters filled with as many people as can possibly get out of South Vietnam before the end of the city. Um, I, this is a beautiful, beautiful book. And it's a book that uh, it, it has, you know, it came out many years, well, a lot of years ago now. And it's still one of those books that I've saved um, that I go back to. And it's one of those books where the writing and the characters really combine uh, to just bring this world to life. So don't miss the Lotus Eaters. Oh, so um, the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. Um, now, Many people, I'm sure, have read the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. Everybody that I asked about it when I re when I read it, uh, read this new edition, um, everybody said, oh, yeah, I, re I read it when I was in college. Well, I can't remember if I read it when I was in college, but I decided to pick it up and read it because there is a new edition of it. This is so, so. Um, ignore this uh, picture. And this is what the new edition looks like. The autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, written by Gertrude Stein. And this new edition, the reason why I picked it up to read it is that the new edition has amazingly beautiful, wonderful, Color Pictures by an artist who I adore, Mara Kalman, K-A-L-M-A-N. 
And um, so this is the front of the book. This is Alice B. Toklas. And if you look closely, you can see that Alice has a little mustache, which she did in real life. Um, and that's how she's always shown. Um, and Mara Coleman really captures these two women wonderfully, wonderfully well. This is the back of the new edition. There's Alice and Gertrude. So this is an absolutely brilliant, fun, entertaining book. Um, in, in the uh, early years of the 20th century, uh, Gertrude Stein and Alice Toklas, two American women, set up a salon together and they were, for all intents and purposes, married for um, a gazillion years. Um, this was a book that was published in 1933. So it's, it's called, as you see, The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, but really, this is the autobiography of Gertrude Stein writing as though she were Alice B. Toklas. And what that does is give her so much room to be so entertaining and to make fun of herself for Gertrude Stein to really make fun of herself. And I'm gonna read a little excerpt from the book. Um, the salon that the two set up in Paris, everybody came to visit, everyone. Um, all the artists, uh, uh, Picasso and Brock and artists that really did not become household names like those two. Hemingway came there, every American expatriate was came to sort of pay um, homage to uh, to Gertrude and to Alice B. Toklas. Cezanne was there. And, and what this new edition has done the, with the illustrations by Mara Kalman is really, um, is really capture the fun, the entertainment of this book. Uh, it's one of those books that I just sat down. I mean, it, it was a perfect book because it has nothing to do with the present, the world we're living in. It has nothing to do with the pandemic. It had nothing to do with the, with the weeks and months leading up to the election. It's its own wonderful little world. And I just wanted to read you um, a, a brief excerpt from this book. Um, so, um, at, so this is um, a part of the book um, where, where Gertrude Stein in the voice of Alice B. Toklas is talking about um, her, uh, Gertrude Stein's book, The Making of Americans. Um, and these two people, a husband and wife, Hawes and Mina, were among the very earliest to be interested in the work of Gertrude Stein. Hawes had been fascinated with what he had read in manuscript of The Making of Americans. He did, however, plead for commas. Gertrude Stein said commas were unnecessary, that the sense should be intrinsic and not have to be explained by commas, and otherwise commas were only a sign that one should pause and take breath, but one should know of oneself when one wanted to pause and take breath. However, as she liked Howes very much, and he had given her a delightful painting, she gave him two commas. It must, however, be added that on rereading the manuscript, she took the commas out. Isn't that wonderful? I love this book. Um, I, I just think any, any, um, anyone, any, any English major, any reader, any per, anybody interested in um, the cultural life of the 20th century, I think would find this book an absolute delight. Okay. Set my heart to five. Oh my gosh. Um, I, this is another, this is a brand, this is a book that just came out. It came out in September. I absolutely adored this book. Um, uh, Simon Stevenson is a British writer. His first book was a memoir, a sad memoir, a very hard memoir to write, I imagine, about the death of his brother. 
Um, but then he came to work for Pixar uh, as, a, um, as a screenwriter. And while he was doing his work for Pixar, he wrote this book, Set My Heart to Five. Um, it's the story of, it's set a bit in the future. What Simon Stevenson would, he would say, um, this is not a dystopian novel, it's a mystopian novel. All the things that are missing from the world that the book is set. And one of those things that is missing from that world um, is the internet. So uh, much has been lost because there is no internet, but as you'll see in the book, perhaps much has been gained. Um, the main character in this book is an android, a bot named, um, named Jared. And Jared works as a dentist in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Um, because androids have, have really um, been given the jobs that humans don't really want to do. Um, the big, and being a dentist is one of them because you're hurting all these people in order to um, make them better. And that hurting can be for an emotional person that 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 being a dentist can be um, quite quite an emotional um, roller coaster, I guess. The only difference between an android and a human is that androids aren't supposed to have emotions. They are not built to have emotions. But Jared, this dentist in Ypsilanti, Michigan discovers that he does have emotions. And the reason that he does have emotion, the reason he finds out that he does have emotions is that he watches the movie Love Story and, and reacts to it in the way many of us reacted to Love Story. Um, and so what, what Jared decides that he has to do is he has to go to Hollywood and write a movie, you know, write a film, uh, that will show Americans be, that will show, show everyone, show humans that androids have feelings too. This is one of those books. I just laughed almost, I laughed almost throughout this entire book. There were just paragraphs I had to read um, out loud um, to my husband. But it's a book also that is extremely heartwarming. And I interviewed Simon Stevenson for my TV show that, and you can Google, if you Google um, Simon Stevenson, Nancy Pearl or Seattle Channel, Simon Stevenson, you could watch that interview. One of the things I asked him was how, how he felt about having his novel described as heartwarming. Because sometimes when a novel is described as heartwarming, it, you know, it, it, it implies that it's a little sappy. This book is not sappy. It's, it's funny, it's really, it's really smart, and, um, and it is heartwarming. It's called Set My Heart to Five. You might recognize the five as a toaster, and these are pieces of toast popping up from the toaster, and that's because androids share with toasters some of the uh, kind of programming that goes into um, into making a toaster work is a little bit of what makes an Android work. And toasters, you usually, the highest that you usually can set them to is five. So that's Set My Heart to Five uh, by Simon Stevenson. Okay, next. Um, Graham Swift, here we are. Oh, so Graham Swift um, is such a wonderful, wonderful writer. And I discovered Graham Swift uh, years and years, well, like a long, long, long time ago when I was living in Tulsa, Oklahoma and working at a bookstore there with his novel, Waterland, and um, which is still one of the high points, I think, in my reading life. Um, Graham Swift won the Booker Prize for his book, Last Orders, which weirdly enough, I, I didn't love. Um, but I will always pick up a Graham Swift novel because his characters, because they're all, his characters are so, um, he's such a, a, an observant, quietly observant, I mean, oh my gosh, I'm not saying this well. Graham Swift is such a wonderful writer. 
and his characters are always kind of quietly ordinary people whose lives contain multitudes. Um, and this is a book that's set in, here we are, is a book set in 1959 um, in Brighton, England, uh, in a vaudeville theater that is on the pier in Brighton. And it's the story of um, the intertwined story of three people um, in that vaudeville show. Um, the, the announcer, Jack, um, the, a magician who's just extraordinary, Ronnie, and Ronnie's assistant, the beautiful Evie. Um, the book goes back and forth in time so that we get a sense of, of these characters' lives both before they all came together and met at the vaudeville show and, and what happened afterwards, after that summer of 1959. The main character is mainly, um, really the book revolves around Ronnie, the magician who was evacuated from London during the Blitz and, and was sent into the country and the family that he lived with. Um, the father uh, was, uh, his big hobby, the father's big hobby was uh, doing magic trips. So, so that's where Ronnie learned his, his um, magic. If you like wonderful writing, just wonderful writing, um, don't miss Graham Swift at all. And definitely don't miss Here We Are. Okay. Um, another brand new book that I loved is Hench. Uh, it's a first novel um, and um, it's, it's a novel, gosh, I, I just, I thought, I love, I thought this was just a wonderful book. And I, and I interviewed Natalie Walshots just a couple days ago, and that'll be up on the Seattle channel um, probably next month. So, so, you know, superheroes, the good guys always have sidekicks. Um, uh, you know, think of Batman and Robin, for example. But the bad guys, the criminals, what do they have? They have henchmen, right, who do the dirty work for them, hench people. And the main character in this book, a young woman named Anna, is a hench. She's a henchwoman for criminals. But Anna's big talent is not... Um, uh, with guns, uh, you know, she's not she's she's not the person who's going to shoot the the good guys. Uh, you know, it's none of that. Her big talent is manipulating big data and transferring that information onto spreadsheets. And as a result, and doing as a result of that, cost benefit analyses. And she starts doing cost benefit analyses of the superheroes in, in, who are operating in the world in which she lives. And she discovers that they cause, it, it could be argued that they cause more harm than good, uh, no matter what lives they save. And so she and a really bad man who is her employer go after this superhero. It's great. It's fast moving. It's a really good audio book. And um, it, it, if you want a page turner and you want to read about a real kick ass main character, female character, then Hench is the book for you. Next. Nothing to See Here by Kevin Wilson. Oh my gosh, another wonderful, wonderful book. Um, this is a novel. Kevin Wilson wrote *The Family Fang*, first of all, which I thought was, which I really was a novel that I really, really enjoyed. Um, and this is his newest novel. Um, it's the story of a young woman named Lillian who um, goes off to college. Her roommate is a, a girl named Madison who comes from a very different um, part of society than Lillian does. And you know their lives go in very different directions, but Lillian gets a call from Madison, um, and Madison wants Lillian to come and be uh, the nanny for her stepchildren um, because her husband is running for uh, a senator, and 
she doesn't um, or is involved in politics and she has this problem or the stepchildren have a problem, which is that when they get um, upset or when something is going on around them that makes them feel uneasy, they spontaneously burst into flames, they combust. Now they're not hurt by this at all, but Madison does not want this to become public. And Lillian goes to take care of those young twins. And um, this is the story of what happens next. It's, it's um, yeah, it's a really, really good book. And um, I highly, as I, as all of these books, I highly recommend all of these books, but Kevin Wilson's is one of them. Okay, I'm gonna talk fast because I've been talking a long time. Um, this Run Me to Earth by Paul Yoon is, you can, I mean, it just, it's such a beautiful, beautiful novel. Um, it's, it's a novel that's beautiful and tragic. And when I was reading it, I thought about those lines of Wilfred Owens, my subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. And this is a book, um, you, you know, the prose is so, so st it's just stunning prose. It, it's like poetry when you're reading it. The prose is spare, it's subtle, and it's unsentimental. And what that all adds up to is it's the kind of novel that will really stay with you long after you finish the last page. So the main characters in this book are three teenage orphans um, who in the 1960s have come together um, really out of loss, have come together to form a family because they're all that's left of their families in the Laotian countryside. The US bombing raids on their small country are continuing and Laos is a country that is less than half the size of Texas and the US bombing was really daily. It was a place that was a very difficult place to try to grow up in. And these three orphans have come together and Paul Yoon follows these three orphans during the war and afterwards. Um, it's, it's just, um, I interviewed Paul Yoon uh, last year when this book came out, when we were still doing in-person interviews. And um, you can watch that interview as well. He's a very thoughtful um, young writer. And this is his second novel and fourth book. I think he has two collections of short stories or third book, one collection of short stories. So that's Run Me to Earth by Paul Yoon. And lastly, this is where the online book list is. Um, so you can get that. And lastly, I think I'll just tell you a little bit about my new book um, that I wrote with a good friend of mine called, um, the name of the book is The Writer's Library. And this is conversations, interviews with 20, three writers about the about the, the important books in their lives not the books they've written but the books they've read and the uh, writers that we interviewed include Louise Erdrich, Luis Alberto Urea, um, Madeline Miller who wrote Circe and Song of Achilles, T.C. Boyle, um, um, oh gosh I'm forgetting um, everybody. Um, but the man who wrote, um, oh my God, what is his name? Uh, the man who wrote the books, the book about uh, the Russian in the hotel. <laughs> um, anyway, there are 22 interviews. Oh, Michael Chabon and Ayala Waldman, uh, Dave Eggers, Venda Levita, Menga Mengista, Leila Lalami. Uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen, the list just goes on and on and on. And we actually went to these writers' homes, uh, Jeff and I, to interview them. And there's a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful introduction by Susan Orlean in this book as well. 
Um, and it's a great way to find new books to read. I sort of it came out of every interview um, with a list of books that I was that I hadn't read or that I was unfamiliar with that I wanted to um, uh, get to know. Um, in many of the cases, we actually walked through the writers' homes looking at um, all of the, uh, looking at their bookshelves. We did that with T.C. Boyle, who lives in a Frank Lloyd Wright designed house, um, it's prairie style house um, in Santa Barbara, outside of Santa Barbara uh, in California. So it was a great experience doing these interviews. It was wonderful to meet these writers that I had admired for so long, Richard Ford, um, oh, Amor Tolls, of course, that's the author of that book um, that I couldn't remember. Um, uh, so um, take a look um, if you, you know, these are conversations and each one is different. There's a lot of fun in them. Um, so uh, that's uh, 2020 in books. Hi there. Um, I'm Alan Whitman. I'm one of the co-presidents of uh, Friends of the Langley Library. And I've compiled some questions uh, that you guys have sent in. And you're probably going to deluge me with them now. But uh, let's see. I'll go with the ones I have, and then I'll try to catch up. Um, oh, yes, here's one I actually liked. Uh, about Gertrude Stein's autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, uh, quote, also includes a fine recipe for pot brownies, right, Nancy? <laughs> that's right, it does. Probably that's why it's most famous, it's yeah. most famous for that. But um, yes, yeah. Uh, and a related question, um, do you know of any biography of Marianne North, an artist who traveled around the world painting never before discovered plants in the late 19th century? Um, I do not know of one. What I would recommend uh, is that the person who's interested in finding that book would connect with a librarian at their local library uh, because they can do the research and see if there is a book. Okay, great. Um, and then I, here's a specific question, but I, it's actually a, a general question too. Um, asked about Set My Heart to Five, would this be a good book for a 10-year-old girl? Um, I, I don't know, because I don't know whether that 10-year-old girl, if that 10-year-old girl is interested in um, fantasy, I think there are certainly better books for that age that are um, that are really geared toward teenagers um, that that 10 year old might enjoy. I guess I would say, I, I don't think a 10 year old, there's nothing in this book that, you know, would cause eyebrows to raise or anything like that. Um, and in fact, I think that children should be, I, I feel very strongly that children should be allowed to read whatever they want to read. Kids get out of books exactly what they're ready to get out of books. So and I, I, you know, I don't think parents need to be worried about kids reading. Um, and certainly that came through in the interviews, loud and clear in the interviews that we did with those authors. But again, I would go to my local library and I would ask the, the young adult librarian, the librarian who works with teens, um, what what kind of what fantasy novels, science fiction and fantasy they would suggest for that age? Okay, uh, follow on to that. Uh, we've had uh, several questions about books good for a thirteen year old. Uh, we just got one. Uh, I'm nineteen years old. I'm struggling. What would be a good book for me? Yeah, you, you know. Um, so I, I actually did a whole book called Book Crush, which is recommended reading for, um, for little kids, for middle grade kids, for high school kids. Um, and there's certainly a lot of great suggestions. Um, you know, there are books that I loved when I, um, when I, when I did, that I was in love with when I read, when I wrote that book. 
So that's Book Crush, which would have lots of really good suggestions. Um, for the 19 year old, you know, any, any of the books that I talked about today, I think are wonderful books for 19 year olds. I think that, um, I mean, I think when you're, what you want to do at 19 or is, is, is expand your world through the books that you read. And, um, and I think that this list, this 20, this list of the books that I just talked about is, is that kind of, of list that will expand um, your world. Um, so, you know, when I was 19, I was just reading everything, but that's all I did was read. So I didn't have much of a life besides that reading. I mean, the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas is one of those books, The Missing, Tim Goutreau. I mean, I, I, you know, my feeling is you should just try a lot of books, you know, give a book a chance, 50 pages, um, and then see whether you like it or not. Great. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, somebody had a, the same question I did. Um, let me find it. Gosh. Uh, Graham Swift, what was the book you mentioned that by him that you loved? Oh, it's called Waterland. And I, I have to say, I loved absolutely everything in it, except there's, there's some stuff about eels in it um, because it's set in the fens, in the English fens, uh, fen country. Uh, so there's a lot of, as the, title of uh, as the title states, a lot of water in it. And when you get water, you get eels. And I'm not that fond of eels, but uh, <laughs> aside from that, I loved that book so much. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, several questions on when is your TV show and how can we watch it? Um, so the TV show uh, is you can watch it. Uh, the best way, if you don't live in Seattle, is to watch it on the Internet and just to, to access all of the interviews from the last gazillion years that I've done, um, just Google Nancy Pearl Seattle channel and they'll all come up. Great, thank you. Uh, one person had a question, are all these books available through Snow Isle? And I can answer that one, yes, they are. Um, oh, and a comment from one person, thank you for giving me permission to stop reading. Right. Any comments on that? Yeah, so, you know, um, I, I have this rule called the 50 page rule that many people um, might be familiar with. It was on a star, you know, there was a few years ago, Starbucks uh, did quotes from authors on their cups, um, on their venti cups, I think. And, um, and the 50 page rule was on cup 169, in fact. And here's the 50 page rule. If you're 50, and it came about because um, I was on, I used to be on KUOW every week uh, talking about books. And like once a month or so, we would do an hour call, an hour show and we would take calls from people. And um, one time we, I got a, we got a call from this woman who said, you know, I'm reading this book. I'm not really enjoying it at all, but I feel like I need to finish it. Or, or when can I stop reading a book that I'm not enjoying? So I came up with this just on the spur of the moment which is if you're 50 and under, age 50 and under, give a book 50 pages. If, if at, the, at the end of 50 pages, at the bottom of page 50, ask yourself, am I really enjoying this book? If you are, then go on and finish it. If all you care about at that point is who did it, you know, who the murderer was or who married whom, turn to the last page and, and find out and then stop reading the book. Um, you know, the government, Amazon, Google, everybody, you know, has lots of information about us, but so far they don't know whether we finished a book before we return it to the library. Except I suppose maybe if you're reading um, on an e-reader, maybe that information is available, but not if you're reading a traditional book. 
Um, and, and that rule of 50, 50 pages, uh, really worked really well until my 50s, you know, I started getting older and older as we do. And so I had to do a little, um, add a little bit to the, to the um, rule, which is if you're age 51 and up, give a book, take your age and subtract it from 100. And that number, which as you know, gets smaller every year, are the number of pages that you should read before you give up on a book. And, you know, the ultimate, you know, the goal of all of this, of course, is that when we, when we turn 100, we can legitimately judge a book by its cover. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Oh, and somebody asked, do, do you have a 50 page rule for book groups as well? I don't well, know how that would work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I really think if you're in a book group, you have a responsibility to read the book. Um, a lot of people don't like to go to their book group if they haven't liked the book. But really, the best discussions are when um, are when some people loved the book and some people didn't love the book. If everybody loved the book, there's nothing to say about the book except I loved it. Um, or, you know, or, you know, what page were you on when you discovered who did it? Uh, it, it really, the best book groups, really the best discussions arise out of that, um, that difference of opinion. And, and that difference of opinion is, is what reading is. Right. Let's see, a couple more questions. Um, somebody asked, have you published any more of the overlooked books? And I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, those are the book lust rediscoveries. Un unfortunately not. It was a, you know, uh, a kind of 12 and out. <laughs> um, 12 adult books and 11 children's books are all, um, are books, my fav many of my favorite books that were long out of print uh, that we brought back into print. Um, and so I wish, I wish there were more, but they're not. Okay. And uh, is there a way to access previous lists, uh, like from prior years of Wicca, for example? Um, I have, I have, I have many of them. I think um, and I'm happy to mail, you know, uh, mail out attachments of the last 10 years or whatever, um, as, as many as I have to anybody. Um, let me just write my email here. And um, people, if you want the, the previous lists, I'm happy to send them out. There. Let's see. Oh, I see a question here, Alan. Is the yes. new action figure available? It is available uh, from Archie McPhee. I understand it's available from um, Amazon has it. Many bookstores are carrying it. It's a really, um, it's, it's the librarian is action hero. In, in this one, the librarian has a cape, uh, a removable cape. Uh, is wearing jeans and a sweater. I, I just love it. So um, it is available. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, goodness. Oh, um, a question here. Last night, our book group discussed the hair with amber eyes. Are you familiar yes. with that? Yep. Um, surprisingly, not everyone loved, to her, not everyone loved the writing or the book, but it was the most animated discussion we ever had. Um, any ideas what it was about the book that generated that level of discussion? Yeah. Um, so the hair with amber eyes is, um, is uh, really a family memoir. Um, and by um, Duvall's and it was, and I loved that book. I talked about it on Morning Edition with Steve Inskeep. It was really, uh, it, it's, it's a book that, um, that has a lot for many different kinds of readers. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I don't really understand why, why people, um, 
I hope nobody hated it at the book group. I guess I can understand that people could be bored by it. Um, but I, but it's a book about a family. It's a book about the making of porcelain. It's a book about a collection. It's a book about um, Jews in World War II. Uh, it's all of those things. And I've al always thought that it was the kind of book that would have a good chance of anybody enjoying. So I'm not sure why it didn't stimulate a lot of discussion, except that I think that um, nonfiction, when you're discussing nonfiction, you're talking about the topics and maybe, maybe there wasn't enough of, about the topics of the book. Or, or maybe, well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm just theorizing and not doing a good job of it. Um, I just think there's a lot in that book for a lot of different readers. And that would be why that discussion could be very animated. Okay. Uh, let's see, we'll do a couple more. Um, do you follow Jimmy Fallon's do not read list? I do not. Okay. And, uh, oh, uh, somebody asked about the new ton of French novel. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm in a bit of a minority, a big minority about Tana French's novels. I I re I thought um, In the Woods, her first novel was just brilliant. I I mean, it's another book that I talked about on um, on Morning Edition. I, you know, it's a wonderful mystery, and it, the writing is great, and the characters. I just I just adored those two main characters. And, and the next two I really liked as well. But after that, I just kind of got, um, I kind of just lost interest. I just didn't think they were, I, for me, they just weren't what I was looking for. So I, I, and I didn't, I started the new one and just rapidly just got a little impatient with it. Okay. And, uh... Let's, let's just do one more, and it's very seasonal. Can you recommend a Native American book for Thanksgiving? About Thanksgiving or just, um, well, um, Louise Erdrich's um, sister, Hyde, H-E-I-D, has a new collection of poetry that has just been published. And I think those some of those poems would be lovely to read at Thanksgiving. Okay. Uh, now we could do a few more if you want. I'm happy to do a few more. Okay. Um, what do you think? Red at the bone. Um, I, is is that the title of a book? Well, apparently, they they did it at their book club. So red R E D. So maybe maybe next year. I'll 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 take a look at it, but I haven't read it. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. There was oh, your favorite Barbara Pym book. Oh yeah. So my favorite Barbara Pym. So Mar Barbara Pym is a British novelist, and I talked about her. Mentioned her when I talked about the book Brampton Wick by Elizabeth Fair. My favorite Barbara Pym is Excellent Women or um, or there's the other one. And I would, I would, Some Tame Gazelle, which was her first novel is absolutely wonderful. Um, another one of my favorites is, and I always get the title wrong, but it's the one that begins with um, g going to, a, a, let's see, something like, like going to a meeting of um, economists or something like that is not where you would go to find, it's not what you think of as where you would go when you're looking for someone to fall in love with. I think it's called No Fond Return of Love, actually. That might be the one. Um, so, uh, so those are my those are my three favorites. But some tame gazelle and excellent women way first. Okay, and um, someone says I absolutely love the editor by Stephen Rowley. Have you read it? 
Yeah, I, you know, this has been a very odd year for my reading because for whatever reason, I've just been doing a whole bunch of rereading. And I have to say for the last month, I've only been reading the mysteries of Patricia Wentworth, whose main character was Miss Silver. And she was a contemporary of um, almost, almost um, I wrote almost identically to uh, Agatha Christie, but Agatha Christie is very famous and Patricia Wentworth is much less well known. But I find her mysteries, her main character, Miss Silver is a knitter, not unlike Miss Marple. Um, but they're, I find them extremely calming. And so she wrote 34 novels and I think I've now read 25 of them maybe. So, so um, I have not really loved a lot of other books and I didn't, I, I tried the editor, but I could not get into it, which is what I'm afraid I'm gonna have to say when many people <laughs> <laughs> with, with questions about did you read um, because many most of the books that I tried to read this year um, I just have not been able to get into. Okay. Here's an interesting question um, Alan. Um, do you ever feel comfortable talking about books you didn't like and why? Um, so I'm feeling about I, what I feel is that there are so many wonderful books out there that in a presentation like this I don't want to be, um, I don't want to talk about books that I didn't like because why waste time? And certainly on the radio, when I was doing so much radio, I didn't want to talk about, I didn't ever want to give a negative review of a book because, because why waste time doing that? You get so little amount of time on the radio uh, for like morning edition. Um, when I'm, when someone asks, directly did I like this book or not like this book. I'm always honest about that. But I I think that um, I, and, and when I'm doing a talk like this and I loved the first book, but didn't care for the following books as you know, when I, some of the books that I talked about here, um, I, I think that's absolutely fair game. Um, you know, I would never post a negative review on Twitter um, I don't do Amazon, you know, I don't read the Amazon reviews. They're not very important to me. And I don't post on Goodreads. Um, I think that, um, you know, people who do um, blogs, I really appreciate, um, uh, Lori, your blog. Um, because it's so well written and because you 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 are so honest about the books and talk about the good points and the bad points, but you're not going to focus on a book that overall you disliked. So I appreciate that kind of thing. Okay, well, we're just about to the end of our time. Okay. And we still have uh, plenty of questions coming in. So, um, We'll do one or two more or we'll wrap up now. Well, let me let me just, uh, how about answering this question? How do you find time to read so many books? Yes. Um, I, the, the reason is that I, you all have lives and really basically all I ever do is read. And I know, and I know that somebody somebody earlier asked when I listened to audiobooks. So I listen to audiobooks on my morning <clears throat> walks, which are, are quite long. And I also started doing jigsaw puzzles just so I could listen <laughs> to audiobooks. <laughs> and that was my excuse because I don't really drive anywhere, or, you know, especially these days. Um, the mystery writer akin to Agatha Christie uh, is um, Patricia Wentworth. Thank you, Nancy. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jill. Okay. Jill, are you there? I am there. I am here, rather. Um, my screen keeps freezing, though, so I apologize for that. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Nancy, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I, I found it uh, 
riveting, and I was scribbling furiously, taking notes about all the books I want to enjoy today's presentation. Um, as much as I know you did, uh, please consider making a donation to the Friends of the Langley Library. And you should see up on your screen some um, ways to do that. And if you'd like to join the Friends of the Langley Library, just send us an email and we will uh, get you uh, joined. Thank you again to our sponsors, Woodby Island Center for the Arts and the Star Store so much for attending and thank you Nancy it was, it was really wonderful and we hope to see everybody again in person next year thanks Jill thanks Nancy